to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Welcome to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and I'm here today with Bill Schofield and John Harrigan. Hey guys, how are you? What's going on? Doing good. Great. Great. Well, here we are. It is election day here in the U.S. We're recording this episode. And uh, yeah, even just the timing of uh, the subject matter we're going to get into, it's uh, it, it's pretty interesting, isn't it, guys? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, yeah. Because we, it was delayed for several weeks, right? So we, listeners don't know that, but it kept getting pushed back, pushed back. And then several of us realized this morning, like, whoa, election Tuesday. Yeah, we realized, uh, didn't plan it. This was just the day it was going to get recorded. And then uh, all of a sudden we got on and it kind of dawned on all of us at the same time. So maybe this is a little bit prophetic. Maybe, yeah. That's kind of how these things work. Yep, for sure. Yep, for sure. Well, listeners, it is great to have you here with us today. And before we jump into our topic for this episode, I wanted to briefly mention something we posted on Twitter last week. And so if you're a pastor or a teacher, or you're laboring in a missionary context, or you're actively discipling or mentoring others in the gospel, and you've been tracking with us here on the podcast so far, we want to encourage you to get in touch with us. Um, Send us a message through the contact form on our website, apocalypticgospel.com. And we'd love to hear from you and see if there are ways that we can encourage you in what we've been talking about here in this podcast. So again, pastors, teachers, missionaries, get in touch with us. We would love to hear from you, um, and and we want to reach out to you in that capacity. And and even God willing, be able to connect you with with other folks that are like minded yeah. and uh, kind of you know laboring in the same way. So uh, yeah, yeah. Definitely reach out if, if you're one of those folk. Um, now, if this is your first time joining us on the podcast, well, welcome. We are 16 episodes in, and in many ways, I think we're just getting started. But we really want to encourage you to go back and listen to the episodes in the past, as they're going to give a ton of context for what we're going to be working through in these next several episodes. But for a quick summary, for those of you who have been tracking along, we began by looking at the gospel. Um, and what it was as a first century Jew would have understood it. And we saw that like so many other themes um, and concepts in the New Testament, the gospel has its origins in the writings of the Hebrew prophets and in later Second Temple literature. And the Jewish people in Jesus's day would have understood this gospel or this, this good news to be apocalyptic, even though that word has some baggage in modern academia. We use it in the way that they did, which is that history is just moving toward this climactic, cataclysmic day called the Day of the Lord, where the scriptures would say that uh, God is going to judge the wicked, reward the righteous, raise the dead, um, fulfill his covenantal promises to the ethnic descendants of Abraham, etc. And along those lines, we spent some time looking at the uh, apocalyptic, uh, the context of the Great Commission. Uh, in Matthew 28, and how Jesus, as the Jewish Messiah, has the authority to be the judge of the living and the dead on the day of the Lord, and that in light of that, the apostles were to go to the nations and to school them and to bring them into that same apocalyptic hope. And then that led us to looking at Paul's gospel, Um, really as Paul is being a Jew who is taking up the calling given to his people Israel. um, And he began to go and school the Gentiles in light of the day of the Lord by encouraging them to live uprightly, to be loyal exclusively to the God of Israel, all while rightly relating to his enduring covenant with the ethnic descendants of Abraham. And so then from there... We began looking at the book of Acts, where in Acts 1, we saw Jesus and the apostles affirm this uh, apocalyptic context of the restoration of the kingdom to Israel, where he doesn't correct their expectations but about that kingdom specifically, but he simply corrects the timing of its establishment. Then we move on to Acts 2, where we started discussing um, what we call the three novelties of the New Testament. First, we saw the coming of the Holy Spirit as an affirmation of those Jewish apocalyptic expectations. And then we spent a couple episodes on the cross. Um, which was really the second novelty. And we saw how Paul had the day of judgment and the resurrection of the dead in mind when he was theologizing about the cross. And then third, we spent several episodes talking about Acts 10 and Acts 15 and the discipleship of the Gentiles and really how the story of Cornelius um, and through that story, the apostles 
really gathered to answer the question of what to do with the Gentiles who were turning to the God of Israel. And that the aha moment that they had um, was not that the age to come had been launched or redefined, but simply that the prophets had anticipated the Gentiles flowing to Jerusalem to worship the God of Israel in the age to come in Jerusalem, and that the Gentiles who were turning to God at that time were the ones that God was taking as a people for his name in advance of that day. And as with everything that we've discussed so far, we've emphasized over and over and over again that the life and death and resurrection of Jesus and the uh, the writings of the apostles brought no redefinition or reimagination of the things that the law and the prophets had laid out. Rather, they were a forceful affirmation um, of the pre-existing Jewish apocalyptic framework. And I think all of those things lead us to what we want to talk about for the next several episodes, and that's the subject of the kingdom of God. And of course, this phrase is used often um, throughout the New Testament. And so our desire and our hope is really to bring clarity really to this often debated and misunderstood topic. And so I think we want to be both informative and pastoral because as we're going to see, understanding what the kingdom of God is as a first century Jew would have understood it really plays into how we understand the words of Jesus and the apostles, um, how we as 21st century disciples live in the present and what we ought to expect for the future. So like with all of the other themes we've been looking at, we want to understand what the kingdom of God is when a first century Jew heard and used that phrase. And so today, we want to give an overview of the topic from various passages before we get into some history and some scholarship in the next episode. So guys, let's jump in here. If we want to approach understanding the kingdom of God as a first century Jew would have, like with everything else we've discussed in the podcast so far, we really should frame it within Jewish apocalyptic thought, right? Yeah. So what often happens is that you kind of get this popular understanding of a kingdom of the kingdom of God, which by the way, Josh, that was a, that was a great recap. And, uh, I just want to affirm that if this is because people will get on and they'll just click on the kingdom episode first. And so if it's your first episode that you're listening to, please do go back and, and uh, listen to previous ones. We've kind of put off the kingdom episodes to kind of uh, give a little bit more context as we start to work through some stuff. So, so what ends up happening uh, a lot of times at a popular level is that the apocalyptic view of the kingdom is just never there. It's never presented. So, you know, you, you have sermons or you'll watch movies, you know, I'm thinking of like the movie Risen or Son of God, where basically the kingdom of God as a first century Jew understood it, is just presented as some kind of saber rattling zealot, Jewish zealotry in which all the Jews had in mind at the time was, you know, their land and the, and this life, and, you know, totally temporal. And we just want to have a, a happy little life without the Romans oppressing us. And, and so, you know, that's, that's this kind of crude characterization. And that's what first century Jews believed about the kingdom. And then Jesus introduces this other like spiritualistic, universalistic, non-ethnic, oftentimes kind of a mystical uh, definition of the kingdom. And then, uh, and then, you know, in academic uh, context, there's other uh, uh, ideas about what the kingdom of God is, whether it's kind of a heavenly destiny, uh, you know, Platonic type of deal, or like it's the Crusades and Constantinian kingdom now, or like dispensationalist ideas. There's all kinds of things going on, which we're going to kind of cover next week. But um, what we're trying to do in this episode is simply give the option of the kingdom of God within a Jewish apocalyptic context. And so that's what we want to do today is just kind of paint what, how Jews actually would have thought about the kingdom of God in the first century without that crude, I would say fairly ignorant characterization of a bunch of saber rattling Jews that uh, just wanted a little homeland restored or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like that. Uh, we could, we could call that the uh, kosher version of the white picket fence. That's that's yeah. what the kingdom longing was. I, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no. So the so we'll we'll spend some time going through the the kingdom of God and how 
the concept developed down until we get to the first century where they're talking about it. Like, and how do you get to Mark one and like, <laughs> and not everybody understands what's going on because Mark starts off talking about Jesus proclaiming the kingdom of God. So <clears throat> it's, um, you know, you find it, it we'll, we'll find both in the, in the Tanakh and also down through some Second Temple literature and through Targums, which we'll come to define in a little bit, that, that the kingdom of God is not as ambiguous as church history might lead you to believe. It was actually a pretty clear expectation, and um, it's just... By the majority of Jews, a fairly clear expectation. Yeah, and even if they didn't all share it, they all knew about it. Right, yeah. So it was... Um, or at least the majority knew about it. So it'll be a good survey of that development in this episode. I'm, I, th- I think this is going to be a, a very helpful episode. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So so yeah, let's get into this a bit, guys. I think for a little bit of continuity with our last discussion episode, we were in Acts 15, and we saw James quote Amos chapter 9, where he said that the Lord would rebuild and restore David's fallen tent. And I think the key words there would be restore and David, because rewinding back a little bit more to our episode in Acts 1, we saw the apostles ask Jesus in Acts 1 verse 7, Lord, at this time, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? Okay, so again, the key words restore and kingdom, like restore and David, right? And so this could bring us back even earlier in Luke's first volume, his gospel, where in Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel visits Mary and he says this. This is Luke 1, starting in verse 30. He says, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So we've got important themes that get developed later, but they're all coming together in one passage we hear right at the beginning of Luke's gospel. So you get the throne of David, the restoration of the kingdom to Israel, the son of God, etc. And like with anything else we do in the Bible, I think when we want to understand something, we first look left. Like in other words, we go back to the Hebrew (laughs) scriptures, the Tanakh, and then to second temporal literature to get clarity. We do that before we go right to look at the parables of Jesus or Paul or Revelation or something. And I don't think this is a hard one, guys. Like we go back to the Old Testament, specifically to second Samuel chapter seven, where David wants to build the Lord a house, a temple, but God promises that he will build him a house or a lineage or a dynasty. And so when you read 2 Samuel 7, which is just what commentators and scholars would call the Davidic covenant, um, you see that it's verbatim the language that Gabriel spoke to Mary in Luke chapter 1 about Jesus. So how would Mary have understood Gabriel's words? That's the question, right? Well, Gabriel is using phrase after phrase after phrase from 2 Samuel 7. So Mary would have understood that her son was going to be the one who's going to sit on David's throne in Jerusalem and rule as Israel's king there forever. I mean, she didn't understand the words as if they meant that Jesus would come and sit on the throne of her heart or something, because that's (laughs) not what 2 Samuel 7 is all about, right? (laughs) We're we're going to do a Christmas episode on Mary's Magnificent. Come on. Yeah. Come on. That would be amazing. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Um, and, And I think... There's a similar thing going on with Acts 1, right? After Jesus had died and rose again, the apostles in Acts 1 ask, at this time, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And what's the drive behind the apostles' question? I mean, from day one, they believe that Jesus was that long-awaited Messiah, that promised son of David, who was going to sit on David's throne in Jerusalem. And so they're just saying, are you going to do that Davidic covenant thing now? (laughs) So just as we've been saying about so many other themes in the prophetic literature in the Hebrew Bible, first century Jews, Mary, the apostles, they were all pushing these themes to their ultimate end, meaning they understood these themes eschatologically, and they interpreted them to refer to God's actions within the bounds of his covenants at the end of the age. And so, guys, the idea of the kingdom is no different, right? Yeah, that's good. It, like, so in the the idea in the prophets of eschatology is constantly framed around 
themes that we just take for granted, like some of the prophecy or some of God's promise to David in the covenant in 2 Samuel 7. And but I mean you take it for granted, especially especially when you when you keep pushing it forward. I mean, think about what happens a generation after David. I mean, his lineage is is just decimated. It, it's it's like when uh it's like when Cain kills Abel and then Adam and Eve have Seth and they name him the appointed one or appointed because they just, it's automatically assumed that Cain is not the seed and Abel's dead. And so like right after the promise to David, you have one lineage goes left, the other, or one, one branch of the kingdom goes left, David's lineage goes right, but then it just collapses. And it's just full of things that God can't possibly want to establish to rule over the earth forever. And so the there is a significant by the time you get to the time of like the the major and minor prophets, there's a significant amount of tension and there's a significant amount of faith required to even anticipate a coming son of David that is going to rule in righteousness over the nations of the earth and establish peace. And yet, and yet that's the framework from which the prophets are speaking, like Isaiah, Isaiah 2, you know, the, where, where the, the nations of the earth stream up to Mount Zion to receive the word of the Lord and the Torah, and then the result is globally they beat their swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, and global peace results from the word of the fourth Word of the Lord going forth from Zion, but everybody knows that Zion is the headquarters of the Davidic kingdom. And so, like Isaiah 11 is framed the same way, a shoot will spring forth from Jesse, a branch from his roots. So every time you have conversation about David, like later on does the same thing in, uh, in Isaiah 16, I think, David, Jerusalem, Zion, it's not it's not thought of as the religious capital. It's the Davidic capital. Like that's kind of what the story leading up to 2 Samuel is about. And so <clears throat> this all kind of gets pushed forward, like Josh was saying, and the question remains of what about David's kingdom? What about this thing that's going to happen? And and so it gets pressed forward throughout the prophets, but they have one eye on 2 Samuel 7, always, because when, when you constantly frame eschatology in terms of the city of Jerusalem being a governmental center and of David's heir being the governor over that center, then there's always an eye on 2 Samuel 7. But eventually, you know, you, it's not just the successes, right? You have like the, you know, you have, you know, Josiah, Right, and he does all the reforms, and and then you have even later on you have, uh, I mean, eventually, you know, five eighty six BC, you have no kingdom whatsoever, and you have the little blurbs on the radar like the Maccabee Maccabean revolt, and it's it's both the the failures and the successes over time, watching the failures accumulate and the successes fail after a time and that they don't endure forever. It it builds an anticipation until it's essentially pushed off into the future with other familiar things that we've talked about, like the resurrection from the dead, like the judgment of the righteous and the wicked. And so it it basically joins those things and the anticipation becomes, well, this kingdom that God promised that, that David's heir is going to reign over, that's going to come at the same time. And that's kind of how it develops through history leading up to the first century. Yeah, and I think the exile in particular is a turning point event for messianic expectation, for this expectation of a Davidic descendant. Yeah. Because it was so crushing that the dynasty or what was left of it was completely broken. Right. And so you have this kind of, you have a tension of divine revelation that is increasingly messianic and human expectation 
that is driven towards messianism during the exile and the two kind of work in tandem. And you get this, you know, kind of kicked off with Daniel um, as where, you know, the messianic expectation is kind of a barometer of apocalyptic thought. And so as apocalyptic thought increases through the late prophetic material, Daniel becomes kind of the tipping point for kind of bringing all those ideas Uh, apocalyptic ideas together of the day of God, the punishment of the wicked, the resurrection, the kingdom, Gehenna, and these things start to kind of come together with the visions that God gives to Daniel and where the the kind of the anti-Messiah raises up the ultimate non-Davidic descendant who wants to violate the covenant in every way. And then that climactically is reversed, for example, in Daniel 7, where the court is seated in heaven and the divine decree goes forth concerning one son of Adam, son of man, that is brought up before the court and given authority to execute judgment, the judgment of the living and the dead. And so Daniel, Daniel 2, Daniel 7 really become kind of a, a unifying vision for the development of apocalyptic thought after that in the Second Temple period and kind of the consolidation of those ideas into a coherent, uh, uh, solidified core, if you will. That's good. Um, you know, and, and, uh, you mentioned Daniel and, you know, Daniel 2 is, is really, in the Tanakh, uh, Daniel 2 might be one of the biggest connectors between the expectation of what the kingdom is during the time of Jesus and, and passages like 2 Samuel 7, like we talked about. So if you're familiar with Daniel 2, it's the vision or the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel tells him the dream and then interprets it. And in the interpretation, <clears throat> he's explaining this rock that was cut out of the side of a mountain, and it was cast at the feet of this statue, um, like a large idol, and, and it, it came crumbling down, and then it became a giant mountain that filled the whole earth. And so the explanation of that is in Daniel 2.44, what it means is, is that in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all of these kingdoms, but it itself will endure forever. So this is a big connecting point. So <clears throat> uh, an, an interesting thing about uh, Matthew and, and how Matthew is well known for using a phrase, the kingdom of heaven. And, um, you know, so many explanations have, have been given. I remember growing up in church and being given the, expect, or the, the interpretation that, or the explanation that what it meant when it said kingdom of heaven was that Matthew was written to the Jews, and so he didn't want to use the word God like the other Gospels because it was offensive to the Jews. And of course, that's silliness because Matthew uses the word God like, you know, a hundred other times <laughs> apart from that phrase. Yeah. But <clears throat> exactly. an, interesting, an interesting thing is that what you have here in, in verse 44 is the God of heaven sets up a kingdom, and and one of the things about the Greek here, uh, the it's in in Matthew is it's called a genitive form, the basilia to theo. What what it means is it either means which people have generally taken it as whether they've been trained or just read it this way, the kingdom that belongs to heaven. It's he, it's heaven's kingdom, but. It, it could equally just mean the kingdom that comes from heaven. So it's the God of heaven here who sets up a kingdom. And so it would explain how by this time they became synonymous. It was actually referencing the Daniel 2 vision where the God of heaven is going to set up an everlasting kingdom. And so that's why you have interchangeably, it's not the kingdom, it's not the kingdom that belongs to heaven, but rather 
most likely it's the kingdom that will come from heaven and the kingdom that will come from God interchangeably. Right, some sort of genitive of origin rather than possession in which the the origin of the kingdom is from God rather than from men. Exactly, Absolutely. which is yeah. exactly the point to drive that home, right? Yeah, well, that, that's great, Bill and, and John. And now even thinking all of these Davidic kingdom themes that are developed in the prophetic literature okay, in passages like we looked at, like um, Isaiah 2, Daniel, right? I mean, so many more that we'll eventually kind of survey some more of in future episodes. Um, we see them carried over into Second Temple literature as well. And for those of you who may not be familiar with Second Temple literature, this is literature that the Jews wrote that we have a ton of surviving copies of, um, which really is indicative that this was widely read. Um, not that it was canonical in nature, not that it um, they, they understood it on par with the things in the Tanakh, uh, but obviously they understood it as inspired because of all of the copies that were translated and then passed down. And Second Temple literature, I think, can give us uh, a lot of insight into what they were thinking at the time about God, about history, about what the prophets had said, about what God intends to do for the future, about how the covenant's going to play out, and these kinds of things. And so as we begin to look at some of the Second Temple literature, we begin to see themes related to the kingdom of God um, and and all of these uh, uh, linking, again, with the Davidic throne idea, Second Samuel 7, throughout the Second Temple literature. So let's take a look at some of this. Yeah, that's good. And, you know, I want to say, too, um, <clears throat> just to clarify, when we reference Second Temple literature, it's not we're, we're not saying that everybody in the Second Temple period is talking about the same stuff or believes the same stuff or is saying the exact same thing by any means. It's actually a really diverse period. But that actually kind of makes it a little more um, powerful when you understand the diversity that exists during the time, and then when a strand of thought, it's a prominent strand of thought, but it's, but one of the strands of thought in the Second Temple period basically makes it into all of the language of the New Testament. Yeah. It's, actually, it's actually all the more powerful yeah. when you realize that there was diversity, and that <clears throat> one strand of thought really kind of somehow makes its way into all of the every page of the New Testament. But yeah. <clears throat> like, uh, like, so th- there are really, there are so many that we could grab from here, like, uh, like Fort Ezra is a, is a quick one where, where in uh, Fort Ezra 11, uh, Ezra has a vision and he sees a, uh, an eagle coming out of the water and, and <clears throat> he's, he's given the interpretation and the interpretation is in chapter 12, it begins begins by saying, this is the interpretation of the vision which you've seen. The eagle which you saw coming up from the sea is the fourth kingdom which appeared in a vision to your brother Daniel. So it's it's definitely a, like a lot of apocalyptic literature and Second Temple literature. It's definitely piggybacking off of ideas in the prophets, specifically passages like Daniel and you know the last part of Zechariah and places like this. But this is what the interpretation ends up with by the latter latter part of 4th Ezra 12. And as for the lion, I'm starting in verse 31. And as for the lion that you saw rousing up of, out of the forest and roaring and speaking to the eagle and reproving him for his unrighteousness, and as for all his words that you have heard, this is the Messiah whom the Most High has kept until the end of days, who will arise from the posterity of David, and he will come and speak to them, and he will denounce them for their ungodliness and for their wickedness, and will cast up before them their contemptuous dealings. For first he will set them living before his judgment seat, and when he has reproved them, then he will destroy them, but he will deliver in mercy the remnant of my people." those who've been saved throughout my borders, and he will make them joyful until the end comes, the day of judgment of which I spoke to you at the beginning. This is the dream you saw, and this is interpretation. So this is, you know, a little snippet, but you you have there, you know, the day of judgment, you have the, the Messiah bringing judgment on the wicked and vindicating the righteous on the last day, 
And so you can see how how uh, the, the, the descendant of David gets tied into the other eschatological expectation in passages like this. Yeah, so I think, you know, passages like this give us a, a more realistic picture, you know, that the Jews weren't just... The, the idea of what the Jews were expecting in the kingdom wasn't just some kind of localized... Uh, kingdom that was going to throw off the Romans or whatever, but it's a very universalistic, uh, apocalyptic kind of uh, expectation of the coming kingdom. Another passage, for example, is in First Enoch 45, which is a well-known messianic passage within the similitudes, which is, which is a chunk of First Enoch uh, from chapters 37 to 41 that that uh, is more apocalyptic than the other parts of First Enoch. And so in the second similitude or parable in chapter 45, it says this is the second parable concerning those who deny the name of uh, the dwelling of the holy ones and of the Lord of the spirits. To heaven they will not ascend, and on earth they will not come. Thus will be the lot of the sinners who have denied the name of the Lord of the spirits, who will be kept thus for the day of affliction and tribulation. So uh, the wicked will be kept for the day of God. Uh, on that day, my chosen one will sit on the throne of glory and he will test their works or judge their works and their dwelling places will be immeasurable. Their souls will be distressed within them. They'll see my chosen ones, the righteous, the saints, those who appeal to my glorious name. So the wicked are going to be judged by the chosen one, by the Messiah or the, the anointed one. Other translations uh, say, and then verse four, on that day, I shall make my chosen one dwell among them and I shall transform heaven and make it a blessing and a light forever. And I shall transform the earth and make it a blessing. And my chosen ones, I shall make to dwell in it. But those who commit sin and error will not set foot in it. For I have seen and satisfied my righteous ones with peace and have made them to dwell in my present presence. But the judgment of the sinners has drawn near to me that I may destroy them from the face of the earth. So the coming of the Messiah and his kingdom is associated with a new heavens and a new earth and a universal judgment. It's a very cataclysmic kind of apocalyptic vision uh, that is, uh, you know, set forth in in passages like this. Um, that's good. In that, in that, you know, without being too exhaustive in Second Temple literature, we also want to bring up the Targums because the Targums are. It's a little interesting. The so, <clears throat> the Targums are are fascinating. Our fascinating body of literature. The Targum basically is a, means it's a, it's a way of referring to. The Aramaic translations, ancient Aramaic translations of the Hebrew Bible. And uh, Aramaic was the language of the land of Israel at the time of Jesus. It's, uh, they brought it back from Babylon when they came back. And it was the c- common language of the people, even though generally it's believed that Hebrew was still spoken in the synagogue by the clergy. But um, <clears throat> so, like... Uh, there, there's a lot of controversy related to the dating of the Targums, and that's somewhat relevant. But as you'll see, it's pretty, it's pretty clear that there's something related to the kingdom that, that, uh, and the themes that it brings up that is really, it, it, it seems so impactful on, on the way that they use the language in the New Testament. Yeah, they're generally it's they're generally thought to be first century around first century. So they're very relevant to the New Testament as far as timing and indicative of what Jews are thinking. Right. And and so it 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 was really widely believed that they were second third century until Martin McNamara came along and he's really argued for a first century dating and uh, for the writing of some of them, but definitely for a long tradition, uh, oral tradition before that. But so all that said, the the targums are a really fascinating read if you can get your hand on them. There's there's a number of targums, sometimes two or three for each text, but. Um, <clears throat> Ezekiel, Ezekiel 7, the, the Targum of Ezekiel, is, uh, provides a really interesting uh, 
look, maybe a glimpse of how the association of the kingdom with Daniel 2, because the kingdom of Daniel 2 and the kingdom of Daniel 7 are a little bit different, right? The kingdom of Daniel 7, super positive, super happy, and the kingdom of Daniel 2, super negative, super intense. And so <clears throat> Ezekiel 7, let me read it first from the NASB. This is what Ezekiel 7 verses 6 and 7 talk about. It's pretty clear what they're saying. So an end is coming. The end has come. It has awakened against you. Behold, it has come. Your doom has come to you, O inhabitants of the land. The time has come, the day is near, tumult rather than joyful shouting on the mountains. Pretty clear what he's talking about. So listen how the translators, so it's generally believed that what happened is the translators of Aramaic were basically doing a little bit of additional translation work to make sure that what everybody understood in Hebrew was understood by the common Aramaic speaker. And so... With that in mind, listen how he translates Ezekiel 7. The end has come, the retribution of the end, which was to come upon you. Behold, it comes. The kingdom has been revealed to you, O inhabitant of the land. The time of misfortune has arrived. The day of tumultuous confusion is near, and there's no escaping to the mountain strongholds. So your doom has come becomes in the Aramaic translation, the kingdom has been revealed to you which is intensely negative. Yeah. So I think this will actually, by the time we get to the New Testament and further episodes and we start to talk about, a lot of the kingdom references aren't actually happy at all. We'll, we'll, we'll find the backdrop here. Yeah, Bill. Well, and I think it's interesting because not only do we see some passages in the Targums that give this negative view of the kingdom, we do see passages in the Targums that give a positive view view of the kingdom. And I think of a couple like uh, some in Isaiah here, specifically Isaiah 24, which kind of gives this whole intense vision about the the humbling of the pride of man, and, and ultimately the Lord of hosts will be exalted and, and be worshipped in Jerusalem on that day when, when he reigns gloriously. But Isaiah 24, the Targum here says, then those who serve, well, this is verse 23, Isaiah 24, 23, then those who serve the moon will be ashamed and those who worship the sun will be humiliated for the kingdom of the Lord of hosts will be revealed on the Mount of Zion and in Jerusalem before the elders of his people in glory. Okay? And clearly, again, taking this idea, very, very positive idea of the kingdom here. Um, but uh, as the, the Targumist does, he reiterates or, or expounds upon the meaning of the original Hebrew text so that the Aramaic speakers understand, okay, the Lord of hosts, the, the, the actual Hebrew text just says the Lord of hosts will be seen on Mount Zion and, and his glory revealed before his elders in Jerusalem. But again, the Targumist here changes this to the kingdom of the Lord of hosts. And I think this is really, really revealing as well. You get another passage like Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, and of course, this is a passage that John the Baptist pulls from uh, and, and as we'll talk about a little bit, uh, a little bit later in Luke chapter three, but Isaiah chapter 40, verse nine, the Targum here is get you up on a high mountain, prophets who herald good tidings to Zion. Lift up your voice with force, you who herald good tidings to Jerusalem. Lift up, fear not, say to the cities of the house of Judah, the kingdom of your God is revealed. And again, the original Hebrew text just says, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. But again, the Targumist here changes it to the kingdom of your God is revealed. I think this is so revealing in terms of what they're thinking, likely again in the first century, what they're thinking about these passages and how uh, they're, they're again linking the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7, with the coming of the day of the Lord, the establishing, the, re the restoration of Israel, all of these themes that we've been speaking about so much already. Right, and this this really hits it, I think, kind of the core of what first century Jews thought about the gospel. So right, like in our right. initial episodes where we talked about what is the gospel to a first century Jew, we pulled out of Isaiah 40 and Isaiah 52 because that's really where you get the, the language out of the prophetic literature of what the gospel is. The Targums provide a great example of how that prophetic literature is 
bound together with the covenant, specifically the Davidic covenant, and pushed to its ultimate end. And, uh, of course, John the Baptist quotes Isaiah, the beginning of Isaiah 40, about uh, the glory of God being revealed to all flesh. And then you get to verse 9. Isaiah 52 is the same way, where Isaiah 52, 7, where... Uh, let me see it in the original. It says, how beautiful, for example, in the ESV, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And so in the Targums of, in the Targum of Isaiah 52, it gets translated into Aramaic, how beautiful upon the mountains of the land of Israel are the feet of him who announces, who publishes peace, who announces good tidings, who publishes salvation, who says to the congregation of Zion, the kingdom of your God is revealed. And so you have a you have just a, a slight transformation of the gospel from your God reigns to the kingdom of your God is revealed, which I think gives a lot of context for the preaching of the kingdom of God is at hand, the God, Jesus going throughout the villages and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, where it's not defined in the text, but this gives a fairly, uh, uh, seemingly, it's indicative of what Jews, how they would think of what the gospel of the kingdom was, is a projection of the Davidic covenant in the prophetic literature. Yeah, that's that's so big because it it really is it's it, the the vision that's portrayed and that's captured back up in the New Testament is a culmination of all the prophecies of these things the of the expectation of the of 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 the period of everlasting peace of the resurrection and uh, Zechariah fourteen is another passage in the Tanakh in the prophetic literature that is really influential in later apocalyptic thought or the rest of Second Temple Judaism. Um, maybe the book of Daniel and the latter part of Zechariah might be the two most influential during that period. And Zechariah 14, it's a passage that a lot of people know, but here's how the Targum translates it. And the kingdom of the Lord shall be revealed upon all the inhabitants of the earth. At that time, they will serve before the Lord with one accord, for his name is established in the world, and there is none apart from him. So again, it's just the kingdom of God essentially encapsulates within within the context of a Davidic covenant, it encapsulates the anticipation of this eschatological vision, and it becomes like a catchphrase that they use to anticipate all of them. The judgment, the resurrection, the restoration of the Davidic monarchy and the kingdom to Israel, etc. Yeah, so we just covered, you know, we, we kind of highlighted the Targums just because they have so much kingdom language. A lot of the other uh, Jewish apocalyptic material also has uh, kingdom language that is along the same lines, specifically the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, the Testament of Moses. Uh, there's a little bit in Jubilees 1. Uh, you get some in the Sibylline Oracles. There's there's other passages in the Jewish apocalyptic literature, kind of the core of it. I'm thinking like uh, Second Baruch and the Cloud Apocalypse. But the Targums, really, you have so much language in which they insert the language of the kingdom around yeah. Specific, really important passages in the prophetic literature that is kind of part of the daily life. And I think, so I think the Targums, I think the Targums, especially in academic debate, aren't appreciated enough. They're not referenced enough that they're, they, there's the scholarship on the Targums has been lacking, I think, in the last hundred years, more than any other area, yeah, in my true. opinion, of, of, Second Temple Jewish yeah. studies. Yeah. Um, but we just wanted to kind of cover a few of those just to outline, give some basic ideas about when Jews in the first century talked about the kingdom of God. This is the evidence we actually have. These are some examples of actual writings that have endured. I'm sure we've lost a lot of writings, but writings that have endured, that have been translated, that we have a lot of copies of 
that is indicative that this is that Jews were actually reading this stuff. It's not canonical, of course, uh, but neither is from whatever stream you're from, Don Carson's writings, or if you're charismatic from whatever, you know, teacher you're listening to or reading their books. Uh, just because there's a lot of copies, of course, we don't think those writings are, are canonical, but we think they're inspired by God and they're edifying to read. So a lot of this literature is kind of in the same category. It wasn't considered canonical by Jews at that time, but the fact that we have so many of these writings that got translated into other languages that are preserved for us indicates that they viewed these writings as useful and inspiring, inspired to whatever degree by God, but again, of course, not canonical. And it also gives us a picture that the Jews' view of the kingdom of God was not this kind of localized, temporal, uh, saber-rattling, zealot view, was not the dominant idea, but rather it really was quite universal and cataclysmic and apocalyptic. And all of that may be completely irrelevant to the New Testament. Uh, Second the writings of Second Temple Jews, the New Testament may be completely different than all of those writings. Jesus and the apostles might have introduced a completely revolutionary, a completely redefined, a com- something completely other than. That is a total possibility. The question, the, the reason it's quite relevant, in my opinion, in our opinion, I think we're all kind of on the same page, is that you get things in the New Testament that are not defined. They're not, they're used without definition. The last day, the kingdom of God, the resurrection of the dead, Gehenna, the, the day of judgment where it's not really used much in the Hebrew Bible, you get a lot more language in the Jewish writings, you know, in the second intertestamental and second temple period. And then it just gets used in the New Testament without definition. And if it gets used without definition and it's life and death, right? If, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off because it's better to enter the kingdom of God maimed than to be thrown into Gehenna with your whole body. Uh, and so you're talking about life and death things that are used without definition, like Paul, another example, first Corinthians six, where Paul says, you know, uh, I tell you the truth that fornicators, liars, sorcerers, et cetera, et cetera, will not inherit the kingdom of God. But that's what some of you were. And there's no definition. The, it seems likely that what Paul has in mind in 1 Corinthians 6 is right before that, the judging of angels, the judging of the world, or in chapter 5, the day of the Lord, the sexually immoral man, hand him over to Satan so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Where again, there's no definition of these things. They're simply referenced. And so reading the apocalyptic material surrounding the New Testament helps give us definition and meaning for what those undefined terms probably meant to a first century Jew. And it kind of saves us from the circular reasoning of Gentile revelation. Oh, it was revealed to me in prayer and fasting. I had a revelation of a spiritual resurrection, of a spiritual kingdom, the day of judgment has already come. That, it's that's like, the point. Like, where else are you going to get the definition of the thing you don't understand? Right. you got to right. get where it from somewhere. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and like you said, Bill, I think it's pretty revealing when you see that the one thread of thought in Second Temple literature makes its way almost onto almost every page of the New Testament. And because yeah. there's no definition of the kingdom in the New Testament— that's what makes this second temple literature relevant, as you're saying, John. And, and, you know, like, like you said, looking at a passage like first Corinthians six. Um, but I think another passage that can give a lot of context to this is right at the beginning of the gospels, like what Jesus and John the Baptist are talking about when they're saying the kingdom of God is at hand. And, and I think we could just briefly take a, a little, uh, view here at Luke chapter three. Um, And Luke 3, of course, is the story of John the Baptist, but I think what's really important to see here, because 
the average Christian, at least here in the West, comes to the New Testament typically with very little or no knowledge of the theme of the Davidic kingdom in the Tanakh or in Second Temple literature. And so when Jesus and John the Baptist say things like, the kingdom of heaven is at hand or the day of the Lord is at hand, again, like you said, John, it's typically assumed to be something new or something spiritual and having no continuity with Jewish apocalyptic expectation. And so I think a passage that illustrates this apocalypticism so well is Luke chapter 3. And so this is Luke writing about the ministry of John the Baptist. This is Luke 3, starting at verse 7. He says, Therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and don't begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able to from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, does not bear good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. And now just dropping down to verse 15, um, as all the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And I mean, I think this language should sound pretty familiar to first century Jews, right? (laughs) Right. It's clearly apocalyptic, drawn from, you know, the kingdom and the day of Yahweh are synonymous from the prophetic literature over and over, you know, Isaiah 13, Joel 2, the day of the Lord is at hand and it just means temporally the, the suddenness of it and the judgment and the resurrection. And, and so everybody hears that the day of God is at hand. The judgment is at hand. It's actually happening and it's super apocalyptic. It's the wrath to come who, who warns you of the wrath to come. It's Isaiah 40. It's the axe at the root of the tree with the fire and the threshing floor and the chaff being burned with fire. And so there's no question about what the meaning is in with John the Baptist preaching in the world. Nobody comes out saying, what kingdom are you talking about? I, I don't understand. The issue is the issue of response, not of definition. So there's an assumed meaning that is largely negative, that people are coming out in fear and trembling, repenting of their sins because of the judgment associated with the kingdom. Yeah, and, and this is really, and I, I think over the next few weeks as we dive into the kingdom more, what you'll find is that the kingdom becomes like a really massive piece for how you frame not only the message of the gospel and this verse and that verse, but who Jesus was and what who John was and, and how they were seen by their contemporaries, like like John mentioned at the beginning, like some of the more popular, you know, gospel movies, and I, we get it. They're yeah, they're encouraging and edifying in a lot of ways, but it's it's the it's what you read between the lines of the text and how you portray that makes Jesus and John into radical revolutionaries who are trying to overthrow all of these nationalistic legalistic ideas of the kingdom. and But what happens is when you reframe it and you understand that that wasn't even what was happening, then I think it comes into focus that Jesus and John would have been seen more like revivalists versus revolutionaries, kind of, kind of like we talked back about when we were in Acts. Like this, they were, they were uh, in fact, they were not the revolutionaries or the radicals of their time. They were really more like the conservatives. They were more like the guys like calling people back to the Torah and to obey and heed the the warnings of the prophets. And so it's actually, as you tweak it, you're like, whoa, it's kind of just the opposite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I think, Bill, that's that's right on because this is how Luke even introduces John the Baptist 
uh, as a as a conservative, just calling Israel back to the Torah because this is totally. even even the way he introduces John um, right at the beginning of Luke three, just the formula that he, that he uses. You know, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, he goes, all these people were in power. Then the word of the Lord came to John the son of Zechariah. Totally, totally. And this is like exactly yeah. right. <laughs> isn't this exactly what the prophets do? Um, you know, the beginning of of all of the prophets. Which what are the prophets? doing. The prophets, in essence, uh, one one student here kind of coined this phrase, and I love this, and I use it all the time now, the Old, Old Testament prophets were just retweeting Moses, right? So what did Moses say? Israel, hey, come back to do this again, right? Obey the Torah. Uh, the, the covenant is still important to the God of Israel. Like, you need to obey the covenant, right? So the idea is Luke is, in essence, just saying that John is doing the same thing as the prophets, calling Israel back to repentance in light of the day of judgment, the day of the Lord, the kingdom of God, these uh, larger themes. That's good. Uh, in, you know, um, this this conversation reminds me a little bit of uh, of, uh, of an really great illustration that Henry Cadbury gave about a hundred years ago in his book, The Peril of Modernizing Jesus. He said, you, you look back at the, at all of the paintings, the gospel paintings of Jesus and his disciples and of the various gospel scenes in the medieval period. And you have like the thing that the text says, like is going on, right? You know, the disciple, he's leaning against Jesus and and they're eating and they're at the table, but it's what is in between the lines that is inserted by the authors or by the artist's imagination. Like he brings up like, for example, minor details, like they all have backs to their chairs. They're not like reclining like you do in Middle Eastern, you know, culture at the table. They're all sitting at chairs with backs and they're sitting upright. And and, and he goes, in all their clothes. Like, yeah, they might be long gowns, but they're all reflecting the, the popular trends and colors that were popular in Europe at the time. And the architecture of all the rooms where the Last Supper took place is all like, you know, like medieval European architecture. And he goes, and we approach the Bible the same way. Like we get the gist of it, but then we insert so much from our understanding right now in our contemporary context and I think that diving into issues like the kingdom, while it can feel a little bit laborsome to kind of like redo the way you read the kingdom in the New Testament, it really is things like the kingdom that fills in so many blanks in your portrayal and in your view of these scenes and conversations in the Gospels. So I think this is going to end up being one of the most impactful, if not, one, if not the most impactful um, of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, series or the, of the podcast so far. Yeah. Yeah. Bill. Well, and, and I think that's why it's so important that we get, uh, we get these things right, right. That we seek to understand what first century Jews would have understood about the kingdom. Um, because it really matters. It, this isn't just a minor issue. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that kind of leads into our, <clears throat> our, so our, so what conclusion, uh, that understanding how Jews viewed the kingdom in the first century gives coherence to the message, uh, you know, the message of the kingdom, the parable of the sower and these kinds of things, the gospel of the kingdom, right, that right. it's not an issue of like gnosis or knowledge, like some secret knowledge. The secret of the kingdom was not a redefinition of it. The secret of the kingdom is that some people see it with their eyes, but they don't see it, the reality of it. They hear in their ears, but they don't actually hear it. It's an issue of response. And so the, you know, the parables, we'll do a session on the parables of the parables are told to unbelievers, to those who won't respond, not to those who are responding. The, the, the issue is an issue of response and, to bring the kingdom within a first century Jewish apocalyptic context provides coherence to the message of the gospel that you're not breaking up the kingdom from the resurrection, the day of Yahweh and the, and Gehenna, the age to come. You're not breaking these things up into pieces and redefining one thing, but not redefining the other. The, you're not putting the kingdom before the judgment, which, 
you know, never happens anywhere either in the prophetic literature or <laughs> Jewish apocalyptic <laughs> literature or the New Testament. That just right. never happens. And so, but to right. create a theology that then redefines the kingdom, so you stick it before the day of God and the judgment, then you just throw the whole thing completely out of whack and you string together like five or six sayings with the parables and say, oh, there you go. It's a totally redefined. Jesus is a revolutionary. It's an upside down kingdom. And it throws the whole system into complete confusion fusion and chaos. And then the application goes haywire too, into which you end up siding with insane ideas and movements and political <laughs> things. It's like, yeah. oh my God, this isn't yeah. actually happening, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. not going to go there. <laughs> Take Who, it easy. Listen, yeah. who, whoever your candidate so, is, the kingdom, the kingdom <laughs> isn't changing people. Okay. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Josh, Josh, quickly, quickly segue, Josh. Quickly, quickly segue, yes, because I think my takeaway, <laughs> my takeaway uh, is really something that I've said uh, in one of our past episodes before, and, and this is something I like to encourage college students with all the time in, in ministry here in Texas, but um, it, there are three C's that I think the reason why we want to be clear, or this is the first C, is to get clarity on it. We re, we want to get clarity. We want to understand the details, especially as a first century Jew would have understood these things, uh, because clarity leads to certainty. And and I, I think of Luke chapter one, again, referring to Luke's gospel again, where Luke is writing to uh, Theophilus, and he says, you know, I'm writing these things so that you may have certainty concerning the things that you were taught, because certainty comes with understanding the details. When the details are clear, when they, they fit, fit into the framework clearly and, and simply and coherently, as you said, John, um, man, lots of C words there, uh, they, uh, they, they cause certainty in the heart. And then when certainty in the heart and the mind takes root, this is the third C, it leads us to a deeper and a greater commitment to be the disciple that Jesus has called us to be, to lay down our lives, to take up our cross, to look forward towards the day of the Lord and set our hope fully on the on the day that the Messiah returns and is revealed from heaven, um, that we're bold and clear about the message, um, and that it actually makes sense and it's coherent and we can live by it. And, and so I think it's so, this is why we in a, with anything, we seek to get these things clear and and right and and see the uh, the simplicity of really how the first century Jews understood these things. And rather than adding all of these layers of complexity and confusion, um, you know, we can we can walk with clarity and certainty, and thus a deeper and greater commitment to the God of Israel because of His promises. So I have Romans eight in mind, and um, again, this is. This is election day. It's November 3rd. And um, we know, uh, Romans 8, 22, we know all of creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. And uh, not only this, but we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption of sons. I think next both today and probably in the next couple of weeks and possibly beyond, we're going to have a heck of a lot of groaning for the redemption. And then 24 and 25 is where it gets down to it. For in hope we've been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes in what he already sees? But if we hope for what we don't see or when we hope for what we don't yet see, with perseverance, we eagerly wait for it. So I think my so what is who hopes for what they already see, right? That's why frequently the subject of the kingdom of God does not produce perseverance. is because who hopes with perseverance from what they already have? And I think, uh, God willing, the result of both this podcast and the rest of them would be a hope with perseverance for what the prophets have said, what Jesus taught us to anticipate, and Paul and the rest of the apostles, that there would be eager and joyful expectation of what's to come. That's my that's my takeaway. Amen. Amen. John, Bill, great to be with you guys today. Listeners, thanks for joining us. 
We hope that you can join us for the next episode on the kingdom. We really want to develop um, some scholarship and, and look at history, look at some of the ways that the kingdom has been understood um, throughout scholarship. We, we uh, definitely, uh, there's a lot to say re- related to those things. And so we hope you join us next time. Listeners, we hope you've been blessed and encouraged by today's episode and strengthened to persevere in your faith and uh, your longing for the day of Christ Jesus. Yep. So, John, Bill, great to be with you guys. God bless and Maranatha. Yeah, the Lord be with you all. Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel.